made our historian here very happy. Uh, what he says is he says, you know, Mr. LaRouche, people here get frustrated with me because the point that I make over and over again is that the U.S. economy from its inception was based on a credit system as opposed to a European-style system. And I also have documented for people here time and time again that FDR's intention for Bretton Woods was a fixed, a fixed exchange rate credit system, not a monetary system. Uh, now, in fact, the Bretton Woods Agreement, as it came into being, was itself not that, but was, in fact, a monetary system and became a, a, a pretty much unregulated monetary system after 1971. But it is my argument that the only way for us to proceed right now is essentially to apply the standard that Roosevelt had first intended, which is to adopt essentially a fixed exchange rate credit system. But for the, for the benefit of my colleagues gathered here who seem to be incapable of comprehending the difference, once we get down to brass tacks, could you define for them clearly the difference between a fixed exchange rate credit system and a monetary system? The credit on which a currency must be based is the interest and will of the sovereign nation. Hmm? Now, people may compromise with other nations as sovereigns to come up with a common system among sovereigns. But no third party can be introduced in between them. No third party can intrude on the sovereignty of any member or members of that association or that association as a whole. A floating exchange rate system, an international monetary system, is a satanic invention. It is the basis of empires. See, the British Empire, for example, in case of point. The, you know, you look at these Brits. They're fat, sloppy, and dumb. Their dietary habits stink. Their conditions of life stink. Their opinions stink. Huh? In general, there are a few exceptions here and there. Who you know say, well, we got you know we we're in this we're in this boat, you know, but some of the other passengers aren't exactly nice. <laughs> so, but the, the Brits are an imperial system, and they're a parasitic nation essentially. They suck the blood of the rest of the world. Dracula had nothing. Dracula was a story written by a Brit, remember. <laughs> That's not coincidental. So they, they don't have a moral sense, uh, the Brits don't. And they, all they are is a simple attachment to an international Venetian monetary system. That is, the monetary system is controlled by a Venetian principle of an international agreement among bankers and similar kinds of financiers. They run the world, and they say, we have to have a free trade system. You know, it's like a sort of open marriage. A free trade system. You don't know who the, who don't know who the baby's father is, you know. You can attract the mother, but you can't attract the father so easily. Huh? That's the British system. It's a free trade system. Huh? And therefore, the free trade organization, the monetarists, control the world. That's the nature of the British Empire. The British Empire is an Anglo-Dutch-Saudi system. In 1973, it became also Saudi. Because the Saudis actually ran the swindle together with the Dutch and British, which created the new voting exchange rate system of the post-war system. And so the Saudis actually became a part, integral part of the British Empire. Not merely members, subjects but they actually became an integral part of the worst features of the British Empire. Some of the greatest crimes ever committed were committed by Prince, you know, uh, the, whose 
uh, as essentially the former ambassador to the United States from Saudi Arabia, who became a British agent at the age of 16. And this crowd in Saudi Arabia, uh, which has enemies in Saudi Arabia, of course, naturally, uh, this crowd is an integral part of the British Empire. So you have an international system which is above government, which demands a free trade principle, demand that their system be higher in rank than government, that governments must exist, submit to free trade agreements. That is the name of Satan. That is the enemy. That is the empire. It's not the British people who are made stupid by living under such conditions. And they have also got some filthy habits, too, as well as being stupid. But they are not the problem. It's not they or the Dutch that are the problem. It's this particular phenomenon. The empire, this is the ancient concept of empire. The empire reposes in an individual who's selected by a committee, who is given the policy of making law. Nobody else can make law. Others can have statutes and agreements and policies, but they can't make law in the sense of constitutional law. Only the caprice of the emperor can define law. And today that emperor is the international financial monetary system. That is the monster we must destroy. And there is no solution to any of the problems the world faces today unless we destroy that empire. And we can destroy the empire very simply. Make me president, I'll do it for you easily. I can explain it to another guy who's qualified to be president. I have, I have the knowledge. I'm willing to share that with anybody who is a qualified president of the United States. I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, you know, I'm getting old. I don't want to be running a presidency myself. I know how to do it better than anybody else does, but that's, that's not what I want to do now. <laughs> what we do, essentially, is the United States conducts a treaty agreement with Russia, with China, with India. Why? Because you have two frontiers of the development of civilization today. One is in Asia, and Russia is a Eurasian nation. You have another one is Africa. Well, the first thing in Africa, you kick the British entirely out of Africa. Just kick them out. They're British? Get out of here. <laughs> Get them out. Right. You don't belong here. You're a bunch of parasites. You're mass murderers. You, you commit any crime imaginable. And you're going to get, you, we're going to be free you. We get you, up, you Africans, you're going to free. And kick the Brits out. Let's kick the Brits out. And let them ha have to live with, that, with themselves. And that will be punishment enough for them. <laughs> anyway, so in that, in, that, in that approach, what we do is we simply take the fact we create a credit system. What do we do? How does the United States make a treaty? And how does it utter money legally under our Constitution? You utter money by a vote of the Congress, primarily the House of Representatives. It's a presidential action authorized by the consent of the Congress. Now what you do is you do the same kind of thing you do for an international treaty. The United States explores a treaty agreement with other nations. The President endorses that. That is presented to the Congress including the House of Representatives. The Congress must now approve that treaty before it can become law, before it can take effect. Hmm? Money is uttered by the United States legally in the same way. And this, when both are in the form of credit, a treaty agreement is credit. It may not be monetary credit as such, but it's credit. A monetary agreement, financial agreement, is also credit. We agree that the United States will create a debt. The debt will be used as a capital debt to either to utter money for circulation in the United States or for investment in some projects which the United States is going to fund, the federal government is going to fund. 